Speak to quarters. Run out the gun. Stand by this tavern battery. One broadside into it, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Lynn stops ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire! Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's Indomitable Man of the Sea, Horatio Hornblower. in retirement, but not too old to remember and feel again the thrill of a heaving quarter deck beneath my feet, a white-flecked Mediterranean around me, the nearest admiral, a hundred miles away, and the prospect of adventure just over the horizon. On that particular morning, Lieutenant Bush shared my feelings. He was grinning like a gargoyle as he joined me. And only my determination to maintain my pose as a man of iron prevented me from grinning back. <laughs> Blowing a bit, sir. And it'll blow more before it's over. Yes, it can blow all it likes, Mr. Bush. Perhaps it'll blow some French ships out of port. Ah, uh, not much chance of that, sir, I'm afraid. More likely you'll have to go in and find them. Sailor! Signals, Lieutenant, there. Uh, ah, Mr. Vincent, uh, ask her number, please. Aye, aye, sir. Hello. There's no need, sir. She's signaling. Huh? What'd you say? Cassandra Captain Frederick Cook. Cook? Cook, yes, I remember him. He's, he's junior to me, posted captain six months after me. Oh, by Jove, sir. He's signaling there are four French ships astern of her coming out from the star west. Beat to quarters, if you please, Mr. Bush, and wear the ship directly. Aye, aye, sir. Four to two. That'll be a fight worth having, sir. But I knew that Bush, that old war horse, was to be disappointed. It was not my task to fight against heavy odds until I made sure that the situation demanded it. Other British ships might be in pursuit. Rushing into battle without thought might be as bad as rushing out of it. Further signaling elicited the information that the French ships were six miles astern of Cassandra, bearing northeast. Another message stated that no other British ships were at hand. This confirmed my suspicion that these four enemy vessels had broken out of Toulon Harbor. But whither were they bound? Bush had his own theory. I think they must be on a raiding expedition, sir. No, I doubt it. Frigates would be cheaper and more effective for raiding. Oh. My guess is that they're laden with stores for Barcelona. If I know Bonaparte, he's heard that there are three British ships in these waters, and he's hoping that four Frenchmen can get through with stores and crush the British squadron on the way. Oh, well, we're all ready to show them how wrong Boney is, sir. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Bush, but that's just what I'm not going to do. The flagship and the Caligula are nowhere near us. If we get knocked out, the French ships may get through before our squadron can reach them. Oh. We must keep between them and their objective, and out of sight. Surprise will be half the battle. Mr. Vincent, I have sent this message. The radio sir. Sutherland to Cassandra, set all sail to westward. Seek ships Pluto and Caligula, bring them down to Barcelona. Aye, aye, sir. Mr. Savage, take a grass and climb to the mizzen topmast cross trees. Let us know what you can see of the enemy. 
What do you see, Mr. Savage? Four sails, sir. About half a mile between each. Rolling along in lovely French fashion, sir. As well, stay there and watch them, huh? I want to hear instantly if they ought to course or gain on us, or if we gain on them. Can you hear me? Aye, aye, sir. Nothing to do but wait now, Mr. Bush. No, sir. No. Still, there's bound to be a battle of some sort tomorrow, sir. Uh, if we don't lose them, sir. If we lose them, Bush, we lose my honor and reputation also. I'm not worried about either. No, sir. Of course not, sir. Southeasterly. That'll be nearly a foul wind for the Frenchman, sir. Be fouler for the Pluto and Caligula. I thought I felt the loom of the land a while back, sir. Did yeah. you? Hmm. That'll be Cape Cur, I expect. Ah, uh, here comes the sun. Land ho! Yes, I thought. It'll be the mountains of Spain that the lookout can see. Begging your pardon, sir, it's the other direction I'm interested in. What's that? Masthead there, do you see anything of the enemy? Nothing, sir. Nothing in sight by the land to lure. Have we lost them, sir? Don't say we've lost them. Uh, <clears throat> uh, put the ship about, Mr. Gerard, and lay her on the starboard tack. Aye, right, sir. Whatever anxiety I felt, I was confident that no trace of it showed in my manner. But I was very anxious. The French might have altered course in the night and be lost now in the middle of the western Mediterranean. But I thought it unlikely. It was more probable that my officers had made insufficient allowance for the unhandiness of the French crews. Many French captains made a practice of heaving to at night, in which case we could easily have gained 20 miles on them. By retracing my course, I was confident that I should sight them again. At least, I tried to be confident. And I, I think my officers thought me so. I think the captain's a bit worried, Mr. Bush. He doesn't show it, of course, but if we have lost those frogs... It's not fair thinking about Mr. Gerard. Admiral Leighton would break him for it. But I've never known his judgment to be wrong yet. No, sir. But anyone can make a mistake. I hope we haven't lost them anyway. I was looking forward to a real scrap today. We may get it yet. <laughs> you think the captain's worried. Look at him taking his bath under the deck pump there. He's no more concerned than if he were in Portsmouth Harbor. <laughs> Shaving, too. That's his way, sir. But I'll bet that pump is no colder than the chill round his heart this morning. You're a pessimist, Mr. Gerard. In any case, there's enough to worry the captain. If we've lost the French, there's trouble. And if we haven't, it means a fight. Now, a fight is just fun for us. But it's a heavy responsibility for a captain. The safety of ship and men are his responsibility. Uh, oh, Mr. Bush, I shall uh, go below. <clears throat> Call me if anything transpires. Aye, aye, sir. The wind's still working around thoroughly, sir. I should think...
close hold, Mr. Bush. We're clearly visible to the enemy now, so we can no longer count on surprise. All right, sir. They seem to be heading in towards us, sir. They can do nothing else. They cannot hold their course for Barcelona with this wind. I imagine they're heading for the shelter of Rosas Bay. Oh. If they reach the bay, we, we lose them. They'll have the protection of the shore batteries there. Then, then we'll have to engage them, sir. Yes, I'm afraid so. Four to one. It's heavy odds. But if we can shoot away a few of their spars, we may delay them until the Pluto and the Caligula arrive. If they arrive. Right. The wind is far for them. We'll manage without them, sir. That big three-decker in the lead's flying an admiral's flag. The other three are two-deckers. Yes. I imagine we have about a quarter of an hour. Yes. We'll see that the men get a bite to eat in that time. Aye, aye sir. sick wave of excitement and apprehension flowed over me as I watched the four ships bearing down on us. They were obviously intent on destroying the single ship of the line which stood between them and safety. I could not hope to turn back. All I could do would be to dismast and damage some to delay them in the hope that the other ships of the British squadron might arrive in time to destroy them. What would happen to my ship in the process did not bear thinking about it. The leading French ship mounted 80 guns. I could see their muzzles grinning at me through their open ports. I glanced once at the battered red ensign fluttering at my peak, and then plunged into the realities of the situation. Hands to the braces, Mr. Bush. I want the ship handled like lightning when the time comes. Mr. Gerard, I'll have every gun Captain Flogg do fires before his gun bears. Every shot is to tell. Aye, right, sir. I promise they will give it up, best, sir. She's coming at us bow to bow. If she holds that course, we'll ram her. Let her ram. If I know my French captain, he'll swing to lure to the last. You are all of us steady, whatever happens. Steady it is, sir. Half a mile. I wonder which way he'll swing. He's firing up bow chasers. Do you think those top guns will frighten us off? Up away, Foggy. We don't mind a few holes in our canvas. A quarter of a mile. Which way will he go? Which way? He's holding on longer than I thought. Do you, do you think he means to ram us, sir? Not unless he wants to sing both ships. Helm yeah. there. Move that wheel at your peril. He is going to Lord. There he goes. Only a few hundred yards to spare. Hold your fire. Stand fast, everyone. His guns are beginning to bear. Now, helmsman, helm the weather. Slow. Cross us, sir. Wait, he is. Wait, sir. Sponges were thrust into the reeking gun muzzle. Right, right, the moment right, they were withdrawn, the powder and the rammer and the shot were ready for insertion. Almost simultaneously, the gun trucks rumbled as the crews flung themselves on the tack and ran the guns up. It was hard to think in the fearful din. The Marines were lined along the side, firing at the enemy with muskets. It was obvious that the French crews were suffering from their months in harbor. Their firing was ragged, and we were firing three broadsides to there, too. Well, their fire is slackening, sir. I expect... Oh, look at his main line. He's coming down, sir. Look, look, look. Stay far. Stay far, sir. We're drawing away from her. We can't afford to waste shot, Mr. Bush. A three-decker's had enough, sir. She don't seem to be coming back. Now, Mr. Bush, come here. Yes, sir. We have a grave decision to make. A decision? What decision, sir? Well, we can tack to safety now, if we wish, fighting off the others if they interfere, or we can throw ourselves into their path and fight it out. Yes. Our squadron must be becalmed, or they would be in sight. We can expect no help from them. No. If we fight, we must expect to lose our ship. Try to forget your natural desire to fight, Mr. Bush. And what we have to decide is, can we afford to lose a 74-gun ship merely to delay the French for an hour or two? I think we must, sir. If we damage them enough, they'll have to wait in Rosas for repairs, and the squadron can attack them there. Besides... Yes, what? Besides what? Well, we 
can't run away, sir. They'll think that... Well, thank you, Mr. Bush. That was a decision I had already reached, but... Well, Bush, your life is at stake, too. Oh, you were in touch with me, consulted. Lay the ship on the port tack, if you please. We'll go in and fight. Fight! Hands to breaches! We fight on! Fools. <laughs> the glorious fools. They cheered at their own death sentence. We will attack their flagship. Let her pay off slowly, Mr. Bush. Bring her up on the same course as the flagship. Aye, sir. Mr. Gerard, a carefully timed broadside as you bear. Aye, aye, sir. Now... Closer in on her. Give her everything you've got, men. Stand, Commander! All hearts coming down! Look out there! Uh, the foremost and main mist came down together with a crash that even drowned the of the battle. The wreckage stumbled across the starboard side, and Hooker ran forward with a group of men from disabled guns to hack it clear. I seized an axe and joined the party. Shots from the fourth French ship were smashing into us on that side, and smoke was pouring up from the canvas where the flames of the guns had set it alight. The whole deck was littered with dead and dying men. The wheel was gone. The masts and bulwarks were beaten flat. But still our guns, which could be worked, were firing. The enemy ships looming through the smoke on either side were in little better case. The wreckage at which I was slashing suddenly broke away and plunged into the sea. And I staggered back to the quarterdeck, amazed at the miracle by which I was still alive and unhurt. She's swinging around the flagship coming alongside. All hands! All hands to the pell boarders! Crystal! Hook up! Boom the For a few moments, we can take stock. There's precious little stock to take, sir. Aye. I've still got a few guns left, though, and I'll fire them until we sink. Good. We've left our mark in the frogs, though. They're nearly as wrecked as we are. That two deck is still fighting. Her guns are beginning to wear again. Uh, yes, we must strike our colors, I fear. No colors to strike, sir. No one to strike, God knows. The men are faint with exhaustion. They cannot fire the guns. And here come two gunboats from Rosas. They mount 40 pounders. Yes, Commodore, what is it? There's four feet of water in the well, sir, and no pumps live. No men to work them as there was, neither. Gerard, Hooker, Crystal. What do you say? Shall we sink or surrender? We might float for another 24 hours, sir. And I shall surrender. Is there any man against surrender? Well, I can't see what else we can do, sir. It's no disgrace. We've done our best. Plenty of British captains have surrendered with less cause. That's the two-decker they're calling on us to strike. Well, so be it. Piled with wounded, though. Not only your deck, sir. May I take your sword, Monsieur Le Carabin? Even today, I cannot recall all the wretched details. I was barely conscious, so dazed with weariness. 
The sun pierced through the drifting smoke clouds and fell upon our shattered decks. My career was wrecked. The sun felt very hot above my head, and I was dizzy and weary. He's fainted. Get your blasted hands off him, do you hear? We'll lift him. He's our captain, come on. Our captain. Captain Horatio Hornblower. The finest seaman and the greatest man who ever set foot on a deck. You can throw him in a dungeon if you like. You can batten him down for a lifetime. But England will never forget him. As long as the flag of England flies, the spirit of Captain Hornblower will live. Slip your other arm round his shoulders, Mr. Crystal. Right, sir. We're ready. <laughs> Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers.